So uh, this is going to be a great program, and I'm just so thrilled to begin uh, by um, giving you a um, overview of the historic overview of DAP duration. I've already um, shown you all of my disclosures, but please do uh, look at them again. Um, most importantly is if I speak about the twilight study and aspirin withdrawal, uh, that particular study, which I led, is, been, uh, is um, sponsored by Icon School of Medicine through a significant grant from AstraZeneca. So let me take you through the evolution of DAP duration. I don't know how many of you, and most of you probably would not know, that from the time that stents arrived uh, and how we got to the four weeks of duration of DAP for um, uh, bare metal stents it was all through the work of this man, Antonio Colombo. He was the person who basically uh, put together the, uh, the important addition of a P2Y12 inhibitor, and at that time it was ticlopidine, in addition to aspirin, to prevent, and, and of course, use of intravascular ultrasound imaging to make sure that there was excellent stent apposition that really began the journey of dual antiplatelet therapies. And the duration of bare metal stents being four weeks was really um, a, um, an, and an arbitrary time uh, imagining that there would be luminal patency and better clinical outcomes, certainly with the addition of ticlopidine. But it is really important uh, to note that through the years, as we went into the first generation of drug eluting stents and an arbitrary three to six months of DAPT was chosen for this new stent technology that included not just the stent, which has it had its metallic backbone, but also the polymer, which at that time was a first generation polymer with drugs that um, were uh, obviously incredibly effective against restenosis, but that there was an important event of stent thrombosis that was being evaluated and, and reported in 2006 through a very important um, yet not very well validated study that showed higher mortality in patients with uh, receiving a first generation drug eluting stent and an FDA circulatory system medical device advisory panel that, that formed shortly thereafter the report that came in um, ESC and basically um, uh, gave a consensus-based um, recommendation of prolonging dual antiplatelet therapies for at least 12 months for, for all of the first-generation drug-eluting stents. And then in the late 2000s, we had the entry of the second-generation drug-eluting stents, and we absolutely showed a much better improved technology with thinner struts, a uh, fluoropolymers that were uh, extremely effective against um, platelet adhesion and aggregation, as well as uh, a, a very large scale clinical trials that did show um, very effectively a reduction of the hard clinical outcomes of death and MI compared to first generation drug eluting stents. And it was really the observations that began looking at a shorter duration of DAPT when we started looking at data at 30 days, 180 days, 360 days, and beyond, where we began to see the benefit of DAPT early on against stent-related complications. And perhaps um, if we're looking at stent-related complications for stent thrombosis, that benefit was not seen with the newer generation drug eluting stents. And of course, we also began thinking about bleeding. Um, it was really Dr. Eichelboom who should receive a lot of the credit, kind of turning our attention from the ischemic outcomes to the bleeding ones, especially in those patients with an acute coronary syndrome where life-threatening and major bleeding complications were early on after a procedure were associated 
with long-term uh, here up to six months mortality in those patients. And of course, uh, we also looked at this in the acuity study really showing the, uh, the very important hazard of bleeding as well as myocardial infarction over time that had an important impact on long-term morbidity mortality. So we then turned our attention a little bit more towards thinking about bleeding. And then came the sort of the, I would say the war of short duration of DAPT studies versus the long duration of DAPT studies. And really uh, the most important one being the DAPT trial, the largest, best conducted, highest quality trial with double blind placebo controlled evaluation of aspirin plus a P2Y12 uh, um, therapy versus aspirin alone showing an important reduction in ischemic events with a price of higher bleeding events. And it was very important for us to understand that when you put all of the data together, that not one size fits all, that it can't be prolonged dual, uh, dual, uh, duration of dual antiplatelet therapy, especially when you have these second generation and, and excellent devices available but it also can't be a short duration for everybody because when you shorten the duration in high risk patients with high burden of atherosclerosis, you're exposing them to the risk of myocardial infarction and even cardiovascular death. And so came a very, very newer uh, evaluation of perhaps thinking about de-escalation and de-escalation studies um, could be multitudes of whether you drop aspirin, whether you go from a, um, a potent agent down to a, um, a um, less potent agent after a certain period of time, and really evaluating the contribution of perhaps discontinuing P2Y12 uh, inhibitor earlier on going to an aspirin monotherapy, or maybe nowadays in a more innovative approach of dropping aspirin. And so we now come to where we are today and uh, a historical perspective over a very long period of time of multitudes of clinical trials where when we first began, when we cared about thrombosis to the era of awareness on bleeding and the equipoise of where we stand today, where we know that not one size fits all and that we need to make considerations depending on a patient's bleeding and ischemic risk. And it's for this reason that we now have to kind of imagine our patients and where they belong in these boxes of high thrombotic risk, low bleeding risk, high bleeding and thrombotic risk. And there's a lot of patients who are here in that bucket where we have the most biggest dilemma. It's obvious how to deal with a high thrombotic risk, low bleeding risk patient, how to deal with a low thrombotic risk, high bleeding risk patient, and maybe even how to deal with a low thrombotic, low bleeding risk patient. But it's that quadrant of patients um, where there is a high bleeding risk and high thrombotic risk, where we have to make important decisions and we still need some innovative approaches of dealing with those kinds of patients. So to conclude, I think it's no question that one of the biggest roller coasters that we've been through over the last 40 years of interventional cardiology has been this duration of dual antiplatelet therapies. And of course, we understand now that the bleeding risk with prolonging DAPT is an important one and maybe perhaps as important as the ischemic risk, especially when that bleeding is a significant life-threatening bleed. So we need to tailor the dual antiplatelet therapies in an individualized basis, balancing these risks. And I know that my uh, the next speakers are going to do this in a very, very wonderful, fantastic way. Welcome to Sky 2021 and to this uh, really wonderful session. Thank you for your attention.